So, I absolutely love making dentures, and that's what I do all the time. And can this green block go away? So, I'm talking about seven, the seven key ingredients that I mix together to make really beautiful looking and really well-functioning dentures, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So Finlay, how did you get into the world of dentures? So I, well actually I did, I did six years in general practice, and then essentially I just got I wasn't doing things predictably. Things weren't working, so I'd maybe doing sort of more complicated work, and then patients weren't happy, they were coming back. So I thought, I've really had enough of this, so I saved up enough money to do a master's at Manchester, and that was with Fraser McCord. And I used to really hate dentures in practice. That was a you know, big problem for me. And, but Fraser loved them, and it was like a major component of that master's programme. Right. So, hence, that's um, how I got into it. How many people still do complete dentures? Oh, good. I thought it was a dying art. Finlay, you've managed to inspire a lot of people before your talk, even. Um, <laughs> it is true. A few minutes will be ready. Do you want me to disconnect there, Jim? It's okay, they're doing that. The biggest challenge I used to find in complete dentures was the first impression stage. And uh, David Lamb in, in Sheffield, Sheffield hey, hey. Was, was my uh, tutor. And <coughs> David Lamb, and the first time I did impressions, I started at two o'clock with a patient to do a complete full upper impression. And those who know David Lamb, would, would, you know, he, was a, he would sing when he talks. And he said, uh, do it again, so do it again. He looks at my impression, he goes, do it again. I was there till five o'clock. 55 impressions later, he goes to me, I'm going to show you a trick that'll help you make low money. I've not done dentures since. Um, but he said, get everything out. And I just realized this is actually a real art, a real challenging art. Uh, and, and I think when I see your faces and your posts, it's just, it's just amazing because they, they really inspire people to do Thank the best you. they can. So it's great. Um, and we're getting there. Are we rebooting, Jimish? Yeah. Good. Sorry about the delay. After a smooth running of the day, we've just had a little bit of a pick up here. <clears throat> so it was Fraser McCord that really got me into dentures. And then, um, and also just meeting a really good technician. But I'm actually talking about what I'm talking, my talk, really. It's within that. But, um, but the person that has really inspired me is John Bessford. Um, he uh, just made dentures look like natural teeth and the way that he treated his patients so compassionately and caringly and brought them back to, um, you know, from, you know, really having awful looking teeth, a dental cripple, to having natural age appropriate teeth and just seeing some of these photographs and cases that he treated just inspired me so as soon as I saw that I thought that's what I want to do and that would have been about seven years ago and I went back to the practice and said to Rowan this is what I want to do so amazing so we're taking it forward from that. Is, that is that your practice now full time with, with um, uh, Rowan? Rowan is that your, your technician? Yes yeah, so so I do three clinical days and that generates enough work, that's purely removal, that generates enough work for Rowan to have five days. In fact, he's too busy just with that work that I'm producing. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> That's a good question. So what's the most common mistake that general practitioners make when making dentures? It's the extension. Well, there's, abs there's absolutely loads of things. I'm just like thinking about flipping heck. Right, okay. So let's talk about aesthetics. So the upper anterior teeth are generally set on the ridge. And that's not right. 
because of the resorption pattern, the teeth need to come out. So generally, the teeth are set on the ridge and too low, like that. So the patient shows, still shows a bit of tooth, but it just looks divorced from the appropriate position. So the teeth need to come generally forward and up. So, so that's number one. In terms of function, it's just the extensions of the, the base, really. So they're generally too wide and overextended because the special trays are generally overextended. And just at the back of the denture, in the retromolar pad, it's always short in that area as well. So it should just sweep up the retromolar pad, cover that. In the upper, they're generally short on the post dam as well. So they're not wrapping around the tuberosities. And it should wrap around and just terminate just in front of the vibrating line, which is where the fovea palatini are. Generally, the denture's a little bit further forward of that. And then the suction isn't as great either. So they're the, they're the issues, really. Um, in terms of occlusion, they're generally very worn anyway when they come in. So centric relation is king, but I'll be talking about that in a minute as well. Any other questions about dentures? Yeah? And it's very um, dentures topic, but what, what's your personal preference for a complete denture setup and occlusion? Complete occlusion yeah. for, a, for a denture. Complete so uh, I want the teeth to look like natural teeth and be arranged in the same, so they look like natural teeth. I think that's really key. And as a result of that, I set, we set them up in anatomic arrangement. So there are three basic schools of occlusion. There's monoplane or flat posteriors, and then you've got lingualized occlusion, and then you've got anatomic teeth. And um, I, we go for anatomic just because they look better. And my PhD was in that particular topic as well. Do you then set that canine guide with balanced? Balanced articulation. Uh, but that's a really good point. Um, achieving balanced articulation on complete dentures, it's, it's, it's almost impossible in the mouth. It's possible on the articulator to set it up. You know, the technician can do that, Rowan can do that, and that's what we do for the majority of our patients, if we can. But actually, when you actually put it in the mouth, the actual difference between, you know, plaster, uh, definitive casts where they're actually the dentures are made on the, and the articulator way that like, moves, it is not the same as in the patient's mouth. So, <laughs> cool, brilliant, right, okay, <laughs> one minute, so, so right, I want to talk about the seven factors. If, we, if I put them together, that helps to, me to produce really well-fitting, beautiful-looking dentures. And it's just really clinical, this whole presentation. Here's Bert. So Bert's got these periodontally involved lower two to two. He has a edentulous maxilla flabby ridge. And I'm just going to take out those teeth and fit an, an immediate lower denture and a full upper. And I'm a fast worker. <laughs> it is. No messing. Get them out. So, so that's Bert here. Now, when I took the gate out here, this is the retention that we had. So, you know, it had. <coughs> so, and that's how I felt when it happened. It was amazing. Uh, that appointment, just to actually take the teeth out, was literally about 10 minutes, you know, and to fit the dentures. But it's taken me about 20 years of effort to, to actually achieve this. But in my talk today, I want to try and condense it so you guys don't need 20 years to actually get there. That's the whole point of it. And it's, 
It's to do with the shape of the denture that's the key to this and the way the denture itself fits within the soft tissues. So the tongue here rests on the polished surfaces of the denture and the cheek and if you look further back, right at the back of the denture, you'll see a little bit of plastic just going up over the retromolar pad. So this is all enveloped by the tissues. So it's the shape that's the key to this. And this is Bert at the one week review. And I've got a Lacron on it, right in the center, and I'm pushing on that hard. And look at his tongue, his, his tongue's just holding it in place, it's solid. It's, it's like pushing on a brick, you know, it's firm. It's amazing. And I still just think it's just thrilling. And I want to show you how I do that um, this afternoon. Let's look in his mouth. These are Bert's teeth themselves. I use Shotlander Enigma Life teeth, which I uh, really love. They just look like natural teeth, particularly if we arrange them appropriately. And I helped Shotlander develop these. Um, and they just look brilliant. So, you know, have a look at them on the stand today. And if you look at these closely, though, we've also characterised them as well. We've put some little cracks in, some uh, uh, staining, and we've got a filling. And we just love doing that if the patient wants it. You know, that's the key. But this is Bert before and after. And I, I just love doing this, you know, taking them from that to a natural look and the, you know really nice natural tooth positions it's great and I use pictures you know photographs of the patient so this is actually Bert's brother with his natural teeth uh, Bert didn't have a photograph of himself with natural teeth but he's got a similar face shape so it just gives me a mental picture of potentially what he may have looked like you know so that lateral incisor stepped in I used to really hate dentures. This is one of my patients 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, so if I was actually talking to myself 20 years ago, now I'd be saying to myself, like Finlay, you know, removable pros is difficult and there's no quick fixes. But things that are difficult to do are worth doing because it just makes you feel good when you can master it. You know, so that's what I'd be saying to me now. And saying these seven things are the key points that I need to, we need to address if we're going to get really good dentures made. It goes without saying, we need a fantastic technician. And I've worked with Rowan for 20 years now. We've, we've grown together. You know, we, we're similar age, we have mutual respect, clear communication, you know, these are the keys. And I think that technicians are totally undervalued in dentistry generally. They're so skilled, they need more respect. The other thing, which if I was talking to myself 20 years ago, this is not what I'd want to hear, which is you need lots of training and practice in it to get good, deliberate practice. But over the past five to 10 years, this man here, who's a Swedish psychologist, has, has actually written a lot of, um, and done a lot of studies on human performance and how to get better at stuff. So he's looked at, you know, musicians, sportsmen, medics, and chess players, and all these other things that require some mental, Cognitive Ability, and his book's fantastic. It's, it came out a couple of years ago, and it's just really a wonderful thing, which actually shows us how to get really good at a particular discipline. And he really, in essence, he says that experts have in their mind a mental picture of what they want to produce. So, and this is what I try to do. I want a mental picture of Bert's dentures in my mind before I've actually done them. I want to visually 
look in his mouth, see where the ridges are, see where the width of the sulcus is, see where all the frenum are, all of the different areas where I want that denture to sit. I want to know what, you know, I just really didn't have a clue about the right shape of a denture when I first qualified. I didn't know what an impression should look like. So it's having a really good mental representation or beginning with the end in mind is key. So if I was going to talk to myself 20 years ago, this is what I'd say. Right, Finn, you need to do five to ten dentures per month. You know, got to at least do some. Secondly, and this is, a really, this is a really important point, is being open to feedback, immediate feedback, by preferably from a mentor. So this was like seven years ago. I used to send photos of my cases to John Besford, and then he would criti critically appraise them, come back to me, and I'd have to be really open to that criticism, get it wrong to get it right make mistakes. So, so it's really, you know, being open to this, being open to uh, the, the, the technician looking at the impression, you know, so I'd take my stuff through to Rowan, Finn, that impression's not right. There, go and do it again, get the patient back in. And also being open to feedback from the patient themselves. The other thing is just reading about it, learning about it, reading the textbooks, classic textbooks, delve into the books and then try and put it into practice, going on courses and watching experts actually doing it and working with the materials, you know, watching them physically do it and then applying this as well. You know, it's so easy in a busy day, you're treating your patient and then you're thinking, oh, flipping heck, I've got you know, Betty's coming in next, and, or what I'm having for tea tonight, and what the kids do. But it's just actually, then remain present and focused on the treatment whilst I'm doing it, you know, and really thinking about it. So, let's move on to the clinical stuff, which is really good fun. So, having a dentate picture is really, really important. So, this is Muriel here with her natural teeth. They just look fantastic. And that is just a wonderful photo to use to copy. So, and this is what Mir Muriel came in with. She's got these little tiny teeth, British standard denture, set back on the ridge, just as I was talking about. And watch what happens when I press the clicker and her teeth go back into the right place. The only change are her teeth. And so having this here as a guide to have a, a mental picture of her is key to this. And even if the patient doesn't have a photograph of them smiling with their natural teeth, if it's just at rest, we've still got the lip support and that helps me then position the teeth appropriately as well. So, and essentially, with dentures, if they're class one, the patient, they get class one. If they're class two, division one, the, that's what they get. If they're two, two, they get a two, two. And if they're class three, they get a class three. Because that's where the teeth erupted. That's the zone of minimal conflict for the teeth, maximum stability for the denture. And also, they look better in that position as well, more natural. So how do I get from a picture like this to teeth here? Well, it's really carving a rim, and here I am doing that with Claire. So this is Julie here. I've got the picture here. I've got the rim in the mouth, and I'm carving it. And I want to, again, try to get a mental image of the patient if they had their natural teeth. And the order that I carve the rim is really important. It's lip support first, incisal plane second, with reference to the photo, and occlusal plane third, parallel with the aletragus, centre line, buccal corridors, and that's it, job done. But 
I've worked with Claire for 10 years. She's got a great eye for this as well now. So we both are looking, look, and when we think we've got it about right, we get Rowan from the next room just to come through, and he can check it out as well and make any adjustments. And then Rowan gets this sent through to the lab. So on the screen, he has a picture of Julie with the carved rim, and then he's got this as a reference to work from. And at this point, this is another check in the system, he'll say, oh, Finn, you've just, it's too low, the occlusal plane. I'm going to take it up a bit. So it's adding another check in the system. And this is what Rowan did for her. So, and so just really, just positioning that upper left central out and then back and just looking at the photograph just to try and make that more natural. And it's, the more photos that we look at, the quicker we can actually get to the right point. It's just practice, really looking at things. So the next thing, to, to have really, really stable dentures on a really a base that they're not going to move around on, it's really, it's all about the impressions. And, you know, to get this sort of level of suction, and he looks quite surprised, doesn't he? So, the, so, I don't get this level of suction on, you know, all of the dentures at all, but they are so stable using this method, they're really fantastic. And I just want to take you through it. It's a, quite an interesting primary impression. It's a two-part impression. I'll show you how to do it using this um, stock tray. This is a frame cutback tray, which actually avoids the retromolar pad at the back there. And it helps me map out really accurately an overextended area to then produce a special tray. And it's a special tray that's key. So I've, Claire's got some alginate here and I've, I'm mixing some here and um, Claire's got the, this is a low viscosity alginate going into the syringe and I've got a, a thicker mix going into there. It's a two part, it's made by Accudent. And this is how I use it. So Claire has these little retractors and then she pulls the lips forward so that I can then get access to the mouth. I've got the runny impression material, squirt it right into the retromolar hyode area, squirt it all the way around lingually, and then over the retromolar pad and then all the way around buccally. I rehearse this with the patient before I do it. Everything's like rehearse, 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 so that they're totally used to what's going to happen. Rotate that in, sit it over the lower anterior ridge, and then push it down at the back. So two, three, relaxing the tongue, five, and then a push down. So I get a really accurate impression in the retromylohyoid area. And then just grips that nice handle at the front there. And then this massage at the end, that just uh, helps me see where the buccal edge of the mandible drops off. So that's the shape of the impression here that I get. You know, it's really big, but it's nice and accurate, actually. And I can then construct a close-fitting special tray. And the sequence of design, because this is a nice, accurate model and it's got a lot of detail on it, I can actually see where the retromolar pad is. So I draw around where the retromolar pad is and draw where there's an insertion. There's a sinew at the back here, just below the retromolar pad. Here, it's in most patients if we start looking for it. I want to avoid that. And then the buccal shelf, I take that two millimetres short of the width of the mandible, all the way round, avoiding the frenum. 
And then this bit here is really important. So from the centre of the retromolar pad, I draw a vertical line down, which then connects the mylohyoid line to the convergence point where the sublingual gland comes up. And then I draw a second line, two millimetres behind that, all the way down, and this drops in just vertically into the mylohyoid space, you know, beyond the mylohyoid line by two millimetres, and it joins up at that convergence point. And then I then draw round at the front, just at the edge of the mandible on the lingual surface, all the way round, and then do exactly the same on the other side. So it's like that, and then Rowan then constructs a special tray which just covers that area, and it's got three supports for my hands. So I'm ready to use green stick now and take that to the mouth. So now, can you remember at dental school when you were taught to use green stick with this flame, and then you have a snake that's all dripping everywhere, and it's just like hot and cold. It's just like, well, there's a much easier way to do it. So I have here a kidney dish with hot water in, and in that kidney dish is some green stick compound, and that's softening. I've got some Vaseline on my gloves. I've got the special tray here, and I've also got the Bunsen going. And I'm going to heat up the border of the tray and then stick the green stick onto it, I'll show you. So, heat up the edge of the tray. I've got a, a thick earthworm amount of green stick to glue on, stick on the side. The Vaseline stops it from sticking to my fingers, I can just push it, so it's, it's just like plasticine when I'm using it like that. Heat up the other border, push it on. So this is just going on the outside, it's not on the fitting surface, it's a close fitting tray. So I want the tray just to sit onto the, the gums without anything underneath it. So, and then I pop that in the water bath, I take that to the mouth and get the patient to perform some movements. And I'll show you those movements all amalgamated when I actually come to do the impression just in a sec. But this is where I put the green stick on the tray. So this is looking from the fitting surface. So I put it all the way around the lingual surfaces. I totally avoid the retromolar pad on both sides. And then keep it away from the anterior portion. And I do all of these various movements, which I'll show you just in a minute. And it's just the same when I actually put in, I, use, I love using zinc oxide eugenol, but also Imprigum is a great material for this as well. So I'll show you how we do it. So Claire's got the retractors in, I rotate it into the mouth, over the gum, and then push it down, give it a wiggle, so it's really back down close up and then it's and then open wide close little lip push against that strut with the tongue firm the mylohyoid's contracting a squirt of water in and then swallow and then another swallow and then just keep repeating that process and this border moulds the impression it's a bit like a neutral zone impression but it, these these actual movements are specifically designed to make the denture be as stable as possible and what Rowan does then is from that he replicates that shape in the final denture and that's the key to it I just don't have to adjust borders anymore it's just the right size because of this. Let's move on to the upper. I like my uppers to stay in as well and have really good suction. The lip forms the border seal, lift it up, down. So I'll just take you through that process. I used to use 
compound red cake from the primaries, but now I use the alginate system, which is just as I've shown you below. It's dead easy, you know, light bodied, squirt it round the sulcus, firm bodied in a edentulous tray, goes in, up, and it captures all of the detail. For the definitive impression from this model, I like to use that alginate, so I need a spaced tray to do that with. So it's two millimetres short, the depth of the sulcus. I've got the tray here. We'll take that to the mouth and I add green stick to it. So I add it in stages. I put green stick on the post dam and two stops anteriorly first. They go in and that recreates that space first. It's a bit like a location thing. I check the extension make sure it's not overextended, and then add a green stick to the buckle surfaces. And this is quite wide, it's flared out. It goes in the mouth to get the patient to perform certain movements, which I'll show you in the actual alginate, because it's just the same. But it comes out looking like this after those movements. It's trimmed in. And this is what I use. I use a really light, runny mix of this. So I've got the special tray there. Plenty of adhesive on the tray, really runny mix in, wash of water over the top to remove any air bubbles, and then into the mouth like this. So I rotate it in, I sit it up posteriorly, and then rotate it at the front. So it goes up at the back first, rotate it up at the front. It stops it from all going down the patient's throat. Here it is from the front, so just pushing nice and firm up. So totally relax your lips. And then getting the cheek there, so that's trimming the back edge. And then at the front here, I try and get it nice and narrow under the base of the nose, where there's limited re resorption. And then waggling here for the coronoid process to narrow it at the back. Now, can you suck my finger as hard as you can? That's a very important move. And relax. You can see a modiolus going, mm, like that. That actually really does help with the suction on these. Basically, I'm wanting the patient to perform all these different movements they, you know, they're potentially going to do in their everyday life and it's going to stay stable, you know, at the end of the day. So, if we look at it in here, the, it's two millimetres short, the special tray of the depth of the sulcus, and that's all been moulded beautifully by the patient there. So, and then it comes out like this, and then Rowan then replicates that in the final denture. So, okay, occlusion. So, central relation. So I want to find retruded axis position, central relation, home position, whatever you want to call it, because I've just got no reference at all with complete dentures of where their occlusion used to be. I don't know where their ICP was. It's gone. It's gone forever. So this is the most re reproducible position. And if I get the patient into central relation, it means when they close together, the dentures stabilise. So dentures are just you know, well-engineered lumps of plastic. So, and they will move during function. So if the patient feels that they've shifted a bit, they can just bite together and seat them back into place like this. So, so it's just nice and even in central relation. And the way that a fine central relation, I've, I've actually ditched wax rims. I just don't use them anymore because they're just so inaccurate in terms of finding central relation. So, you know, I, we want to have this. You know, we want, the, we want a simulator of the patient, you know, on the bench in the lab. And, and when the patient opens and closes, it's just seating the dentures. So I just want their head on the bench so we can set the teeth up in central relation. Let's remove the teeth from the model here like that. And then, this is what I use. It's a central bearing apparatus for a gothic arch tracing. So, in the past I used to use wax rims, but this is the secret to finding that home position. It's, it's brilliant. 
It's dead simple as well to use. This is, this is a system I use, which is a Gerber condylator system. It's a Swiss system. So we've got a little pin. So we're basically here we have the definitive models. On those definitive models, Rowan has constructed base plates and then puts this Gothic arch thing on it. So there's a plate on the top and a plate on the lower with a screw that you can undo and it goes up and down. So this goes in the mouth here like this. So this is inside the patient's mouth and the only point of contact is that screw there on the point there. And the patient moves forward and backwards and makes a mark on this upper plate. This is a China graph pencil, which I just make a mark, and then they can scribe out a line on here to show me exactly where centre relation is. So this is it in the mouth. This is Nancy. So forward, back. That back position is centre relation. Side to side. So just try and visualise that that shape that's been produced on that upper plate. Because it looks like this, it's a triangle. You know, and the tr apex of the triangle here is centre relation. And then I put a little plastic disc over it. There's a nice little screw which I can just tighten that up. So there's a little countersink plastic disc goes back into the mouth make sure the patient can find and get into that hole position because often they actually don't go into that position naturally they'll be forward of it somewhere so we've got to get them back in into that home position and then quickly just squirt in this bite registration material all the way around and that fixes it together so and then that comes out and it's absolutely solid secure centric relation record. It's really, really good. So we then mount this on the articulator and try and put it in the same position as in the patient. So we use a face bow transfer on, the, on our, our carved upper rim and that mounts the upper model onto the articulator. Take that transfer off and then we'll put on the gothic arch underneath and then it fits the lower to that. And then, Rowan, hey presto, we've got the patient's head on the bench with them accurately recording the centre relation. You can set the teeth up. So, number six, this is, now, how often have you had a patient where you fitted their teeth? You know, you've done your try-in, they've had a look at the try-in, and then they go home and wear the teeth, you know, finish, and then they come back and they don't like the look of them. You know, it happens, well, it certainly happens to me a lot, and it's a remake quite often. It's just a nightmare. So, I've been using videos at the trains now for the past three years, and I've only had one remake since then, and that was actually two weeks ago, using this method. So, but it's really, I think it's great, this. So, this is Emmy here. Emmy has, she's got no upper teeth, and, but she's got a try-in in there. It's going to be, I'll tell you in a minute what that's going to be, but it's a try-in there. I'm not going to do anything with the lower teeth just at the moment. She's got an old dog-eared bridge, but she wanted to have her teeth to look like this, Nanny McPhee. So here she is at the video. So, at the, so she's got a try-in in place. It's a wax try-in with the teeth set up. And we just have a chat with her, you know, so um, Claire just lets her speak like that and then we have the video running. And then we then sit her down in front of the screen and have the, allow Emmy to look at the video here. She can also look at still photographs there. Also the smiling with the trying in place and she's also got a mirror. And I go out of the room and We've asked, we asked the patient to be really honest and picky at this point about how their aesthetics are because at this point we can make changes but later on it's much more difficult. 
And this is so relevant to people that are doing, this is Emmy's, this is the recon that we did for Emmy at the top here. So we've got two sleeve over dentures which are identical and a bar. And um, you know, with all this componentry, this is like really, really expensive to do. So if we had to remake that, you know, because of aesthetic issues, then that would be a problem. But it just applies to, you know, dentures. And it also applies to our fixed work, you know, the pull down, let the patient go home, have a look at it, or video them, you know, with it. It's so important with this really expensive implant work. And this is Emmy sleeve denture finished in place and a, a lower bridge. So, right, near the end now. Last point is clear patient communication. I wish all our patients had this level of neuromuscular control. It would make life so easy, wouldn't it? You know, so, but I want to just now just run a little video. This is me at the consultation phase for a patient. So this chap here is, is with his, uh, his carer here. They've come in and it's the consultation for uh, complete dentures. On the screen there, I've actually got an x-ray video. Um, it was taken in the 1970s at the London and, and it shows this vi these, these dentures moving around a lot. And I show, that, I show all of my patients this and explain to them that there are, there are limitations to dentures. So, and this is my dialogue with him. Could you turn the sound up, please? Me. So that is the that is the conversation that I have with my patients. It's just really important. I also show them this video as well. This is the occlusion here, and we want positive contact to the back, but pull through anteriorly, and that helps to stabilise the dentures as well. So no contact on the anterior teeth. So. If the dentures move at all, they can just bite together and push them back into place. What happens when they eat a ham sandwich, though? They'll bite the bread. And then the ham will come out in the sandwich and be there. So, so it's really just learning how to use them. Because at the end of the day, it's a prosthetic arm or hand. Or it's, you, know, it's, if, you know, if I had a prosthetic hand, it just wouldn't operate. It's all like my natural hand. It doesn't have the nerves. It doesn't have, you know, it just doesn't do that. And it's exactly the same in the mouth. You know, natural teeth are totally different than lumps of plastic, well-engineered lumps of plastic. But it's adaptation that's the key to this. So I show them that. So, you know, the key to success with dentures is definitely under-promise and over-deliver. I think that's dentistry anyway, isn't it? This is where I want to be. I don't want to be in that area there, promise them something they you know, don't, uh, I can't deliver. So, right, I want to just end with a case now because this actually just summarises everything, packages everything together. So this is Christina. And Christina came to see us in Garstank all the way from Boston 
in the USA. And it was really amazing. I was like, wow, treating an American. It's cool. So, the, um, so let's have a look in Christina's mouth. I'll tell you, I'll talk about her journey and how she actually came to the practice. So she's got this upper bridge which is hanging off. And, you know, those teeth are really shot at the top there. These, are, these lower teeth are really quite nicely maintained there. Anyway, she went to see ten, this is what she told me, she'd been to see ten different prosthodontists in the Boston and New York areas. And she just felt she'd been pushed down the implant route. And she didn't want them for two, for medical reasons. She had a mitral valve replacement and also had bisphosphonates for a number of years. These are not, they don't preclude someone from having implants at all, but she just didn't want them. So, and she wanted dentures, but she wanted a smile back as well. So naturally, she just searched on the internet and she found this video, which John Besford had produced a few years ago. And it talks about how John sets the teeth up naturally, giving someone back their natural smile. And it really spoke to Christina, and this particular part of the video spoke to Christina. That's lovely. It's me. You've got me back. <laughs> You've got me back. You know, she wanted a smile back. So she actually got in touch with John Besford, and um, and he said, look, I've retired, but I think you should go and see Finlay. So we um, started up communication together. So she sent me the x-ray pictures, um, and, you know, we came up with a treatment plan and some options. And this is the sort of letter that I produced for my patient standard anyway. Um, you know, it has, like, a diagnosis and treatment options, etc., on that, and all the potential things to be aware of. So this is, like, the consent. This is, like you know, sort of under-promise, over-deliver type of approach. And we came to this conclusion, this is on the telephone, what we should do, so it'd be full upper immediate over-denture and lower partial denture. Five minutes. Five minutes, cool. And this is the, um, so when she actually, so she actually came over, so we, we booked her to, to actually have the treatment done in one week but we said come over for three weeks just in case it all goes not according to plan. So anyway, when she arrived, it's like flipping out, really high smile line here. Let's have a look in the mouth, really shallow sulcus here. So we've got a high smile line, we've got a shallow sulcus, we've got a potential for, you know, for poor retention. So she may need fixative. You know, that's, and that goes in my reports as well. So that's the bridge here. And when she bites together, you know, it reseats. So she's been like that for ages, doing that. So a mandible has been postured forward to actually hold it in place. So finding a reproducible centric was difficult for her. But I'll, I'll show you how we did that. So day one, we took the teeth out and we did a definitive impression, exactly how I've shown you before. In the lower, I'm going to make her a lower chrome denture. And the impression's very similar to how I did the full lower. You know, it's border moulded in the areas where there are no teeth. And with green stick, just the same way. But to get the detail for getting a really good impression for where all the chrome components, we've got composite rest seats on the lingual of those teeth, I dry off. I'm just about to do the impression here. I dry off the occlusal surfaces and I've got some alginate on my finger and then I just rub it right into the occlusal surfaces of the teeth there so it picks up all that detail and then go in with the impression. So I rotate it in, wiggle it down so it just sits on the saddles and then just go through those movements that I went through before with you. You know, but really sticking the tongue out is dead important with this. Really important is get that tongue out because we're going to have a piece of chrome running around that lingual edge, you know, for the denture. We want that out of the way. So here's the, here's the impression. So it's, 
you know, beautifully shaped for where the saddles are, just like for a denture, all the way back, right over the retromolar pad, and then all of the detail, you know, for the teeth at the front, for our metal components to sit nicely, you know, to give us a good impression. So this is day one. And right at the end of the day, it was a long day, we did the, uh, a jaw edge, or we had an upper rim, so we tried to really mimic this smile, and then Rowan set the teeth up. And also, because she's got this mandibular posturing position, we did a central bearing, a gothic arch tracing, and you can do it with the, on dentate as well, as edentula. So this is a special tray material with the, the pin in place. So forwards and back, forwards and back. Forwards and back. And that forms that nice triangle for central relation, then record that position. And so by day three we had the upper made and we made her a temporary lower acrylic just to stabilise the occlusion. And, okay, we're almost done. So we're really copying this look here, and it was all about the video. She took the try-in, actually, back to the Royal Oak in Garstang, where she was staying, and just assessed it, came back, told us where she liked it, so. And there, there's the lower chrome. So the, the basic point I'm trying to make with the chromes and the dentures is get it back right up the retromolar pad, just like you would do for a complete denture. And there's the finished case. So just characterised, just try and mimic the staining on the lower teeth. Really just give it a little bit of detail. And she loved it. So um, on day eight, John Besford had been on holiday in Scotland and he was travelling down to London. So he came to visit and we went and took her out to, for a meal on day eight, so it was the first time I've ever sat in front of a patient where I fitted their dentures the day before, and they're eating, she's eating goose and a duck in front of me, with John Bessford there, which is quite stressful. So, but it, <laughs> but it, it, was, it was good though. So on day nine, we, I, I just reviewed her and made sure everything was nice and comfortable for her. And we'd had a look at the photos you know, from the night before, and she was, oh, John Bessard, he's so wonderful. And, oh, my God. Look, so it was just great. She was a character. So there we go. So, and this is, you know, this is what it's all about, isn't it? You know, just making our patients really happy. It's, it's fantastic. So thank you very much for listening.